Anna Quinlan, what was your first job at the New York Times? I was a general assignment reporter, which is really all I ever wanted to be. I mean, you go in in the morning, about 10, 10.30. I'm not a morning person, so newspaper hours made me so happy. And, you know, you sit around and wait until somebody says, Quinlan, you know, two bodies found in a house in Queens. The cops think it might be drug-related or something going on. They've shut down Kennedy because of a bomb scare. And you get on the subway and you take your your notebook and you go out. Um, I remember when I interviewed at the New York Times when I was 24, um, I kept saying that. Top editors would say, well, what do you want to do at the Times? And I'd say, I want to be a general assignment reporter. And they'd say, no, no, I understand that, but what do you eventually want to do at the New York Times? And the first couple times I said, I want to be a general assignment reporter. Finally, I realized that that was not the right answer at the New York Times. So I started saying I wanted to be the Bond Bureau Chief because the managing editor, in fact, had been the Bond Bureau Chief. But um, as I'm sure everyone eventually learned, I don't speak German. <laughs> What, what, what was your path at the Times? Where else did you work? I, um, I was a general assignment reporter for a number of years, and it became clear to me that I was thought of as someone who was a dab hand with a turn of phrase, but not necessarily a serious hard news reporter. And I realized that if I was going to make my way through the paper um, to wherever, I was going to have to convince them that I could do that too. So I asked to go to City Hall, and I covered the first two years of the Koch administration, which was so much fun. Um, and, um, and once I did that, I got a column called About New York, which was started by Mike Berger in the 30s. It's the most fun because twice a week you do reporting on anything you want in New York City. And it's supposed to be written in a kind of a, a distinctive literary voice. Um, and so that was a wonderful assignment. And then I became deputy metropolitan editor, um, a stint which was interrupted by not one but two maternity leaves. And um, when I came back, I realized that I was not going to be able to hold it together with two little boys under two and a newspaper job. And I quit. And that's the moment when um, the executive editor, Abe Rosenthal, dreamed up a column called Life in the 30s, which I think for a lot of readers, certainly a lot of readers like me, of a certain age, female, put me on the map. And um, I did that for three years until Maria was born, and then became an op-ed page columnist for five years. Who was Charlotte Curtis? Charlotte Curtis was an editor at the time. She was a style section editor, and then she edited um, on the editorial page. And um, when I first came to the paper, I think that she was the highest ranking woman and the first woman who'd been on the masthead. She was very elegant looking. Um, she always wore these kind of ladylike skirt suits and perfectly coiffed hair and beautiful jewelry and so on and so forth. And um, I think that those of us who were younger and um, thought of ourselves as more feminist um, were a little contemptuous of her. We felt that she had gotten where she was by being one of the boys. Um, and there were two things that changed my mind about that and changed my mind about being judgmental about women a, d a generation older than I was. Um, the first was that when I was made deputy metropolitan editor, which made me the highest ranking woman in the newsroom, Charlotte asked to take me out to lunch. And over lunch, she said to me, remember, you'll only have as much power as they give you. And suddenly I saw her in a whole different light. I realized that she understood so much about how, how things worked at the Times in the newsroom. And when I told my friend Robin Morgan, who edited um, the great anthology, the historic anthology of the feminist movement, Sisterhood is Powerful, when I told Robin that, Robin told me that in fact, uh, Charlotte had been in Atlantic City when um, a group of feminists in the late 60s disrupted the Miss America pageant. They did not, in fact, burn their bras, even though everyone thinks that they did, but they did disrupt uh, the pageant. And, um, and Charlotte had been covering that for the Times, 
and all the feminists were jailed. And when they were busted out of jail, when they got bailed out, they discovered after the fact that it was, in fact, carefully coiffed, carefully dressed, beautifully made up Charlotte Curtis who had provided the bail money. Why did you leave the editorial page? Um, I mean, let's get first principles off the table. I love the New York Times insanely. I love the New York Times the way some people love I don't know, the, the significant other in their life. Um, I think it is now and has during my lifetime pretty much always been um, the newspaper of record. Now it's not only the country's greatest newspaper, it's the country's greatest newspaper website, which I think is an amazing accomplishment. Um, but I think it's a mistake to think that it's all there is to life. Um, I started in New York City as a tabloid reporter at the New York Post when it was owned by a woman named Dorothy Schiff. And I had the time of my life there. Working for a tabloid is so much fun. And it's forgiving. And the Times is unforgiving because of what it is, because of who reads it. Um, so I always thought that someday again I would have a, have a life outside the Times. And I also believe that most opinion columnists, most pundits, stay too long. They, they stay to the point that readers open the paper in the morning and say, oh, that again. And I never wanted anyone to say, oh, that again, about one of my columns. So I stayed just long enough to feel like I was pretty good at what I did. And then I left to be a novelist. And um, it, uh, it's been a very happy confluence of, of craft. Anna Quinlan, how long were you at Newsweek writing columns? I wrote columns at Newsweek for nine years, but that column was only every other week. The Times op-ed page, as most readers know, is two columns a week every week. And to have a column every other week really opens up more writing room for you. And in, in some ways it was a very, very happy um, schedule because one week I would be working on a column which is wonderful because you can rely on the reporting and because when it's done it's done and then the next week I'd be working on a novel which is um, so challenging for me and and opens up so many other um, vistas in terms of my writing but has the disadvantage of deferred gratification. I mean, you work on it for two or three years and veer wildly from thinking it's the best thing you've ever done to you've wasted your life. So that, that to, to trade off between that and the columns was really, really nice. Good afternoon and welcome to Book TV on C-SPAN 2. This is our monthly in-depth program, three hours with one author and his or her body of work. This month, Author, novelist, column writer, Anna Quinlan is our guest for the next three hours. We're going to put the phone numbers up on the screen. If you'd like to dial in, we'll begin taking those calls in just a few minutes. You can also send us a tweet, book TV, or, or an email, booktv at cspan.org, or a tweet, at booktv, twitter.com, or at booktv. Anna Quinlan is the author of several nonfiction books. We want to show you those right now, beginning in Living out Loud 1988 that came out, Thinking Out Loud came out in 1993, How Reading Changed My Life 1998, A Short Guide to a Happy Life in 2000, Loud and Clear in 2004, and Imagined London also in 2004, Being Perfect came out in 2005, Good Dog Stay came out in 07, and now her memoir is her latest, Lots of Candles, Plenty of Cake, a memoir. How many novels have you written? I've written six. I'm working on my seventh. And do you prefer writing nonfiction or fiction? I find writing fiction at this point in my career more challenging. I mean, I've been a reporter on and off since I was 18 years old and a columnist since I was 29. And while I love doing that kind of work, it doesn't push me at this point um, quite the way novel writing does. In your memoir that just came out a couple weeks ago, Lots of Candles, Plenty of Cake, you talk about feminism today, and you talk about Gloria Steinem, Betty Friedan, and female impersonators. How do you feel about feminism today? Oh, 
It's great. It's so great. I mean, people will say to me, who's the next Gloria? Who's the next?